Hey everybody, join me on my first ever video looking at the Euler-Lagrange uh, equations for a double pendulum. I'm going to present the full derivation, skip over some of the, the messier algebra parts, and try to tie it into a uh, Mathematica notebook uh, with a simulation based on those equations, which shows the chaotic nature of a rather simple system known as the, the double pendulum. It's a classic problem in Newtonian mechanics, and we're going to use the Lagrangian formalism of, uh, of classical mechanics to take a look at some of the really interesting aspects uh, of this system. Thanks for tuning in. Check out these, these derivations. All right, welcome everybody. We're going to be looking at the double pendulum today for my kickoff video on physics online lectures. We're going to do the double pendulum. Um, Euler-Lagrange equations, the, Euler, the, the Lagrangian formalism of classical mechanics. It appeared in 1788, and we're going to also look at chaos and nonlinear dynamics. A lot of really interesting stuff here, especially in the case of chaos and the, the beauty and simplicity, the elegance, the mathematical elegance of the Lagrangian formalism. And, um, and so let's go ahead and get started. Let me first draw a diagram of what I mean by a double pendulum. So we have like some sort of ceiling or fixture here that's rigid and we have a, a pivot point affixed to that ceiling right here and we have some length of massless wire. Um, I don't have any massless wire handy um, you could probably get it from Amazon Prime. <laughs> okay, not really. But uh, these sort of spherical cow problems that we solve, um, as they say, are pedagogical. That is to say, we're going to be learning through a demonstration some important skills and, and problem-solving techniques without, uh, without too much complexity that that um, does a better job of approximating reality. And so we're going to have our first pendulum here with a mass m1 at the end of it. Now right here, if we stop here, it's the simple pendulum, non-double pendulum, and it'd be pretty straightforward to get a solution of the dynamics of this swinging mass. But we're going to add just one more mass, let's call it M2, on the end of a, another pendulum. So the first mass is here, but the first mass also acts as a pivot for the a frictionless pivot point for the second mass to swing on. And they don't have to be the same length. Let's call this one L1 and this one L2, where L2 is just this component and L1 is just the first length of, of massless wire. And um, so you can't have a course in Euler-Lagrange mechanics without talking about generalized coordinates. That is to say, a coordinate that completely describes the state of the system, um, which does not necessarily conform to um, you know, Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates or spherical coordinates or anything like that. They could be, and we, we oftentimes will make use of those uh, coordinate systems, uh, but a generalized coordinate, I see one of them right here. Uh, if you drop a vertical down here and call this angle theta 1, that is the angle which uh, which locates mass 1. Um, and also we have theta 2, which is also drawn with respect to the vertical. Um, and these are independent coordinates. The problem we want to solve is 
solve, and I'm going to oftentimes use the acronym EOM. I don't really like acronyms, but here it works. I did it up here to EL, that's the Euler Lagrange. Um, equation. I'm not going to derive in this video where the Euler-Lagrange equation comes from. Uh, I might uh, consider that for another episode, but for now, let's just focus on solving the, for the equation of motion uh, for the double pendulum. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing we have to do when we are trying to find the equations of motion of the system is to write down first what is the Euler-Lagrange equation in case um, you're unfamiliar with it and that equals zero or i equals one to all the way to however many there are now you might see it written the other way around you might have uh, dl by dq minus d by dt dl dq dot equals zero but that's just it's the same thing it's an equivalent expression because it equals zero and so it's it's a negative zero is is nonsensical it's just a zero so you can write it in either order you want i like i like it in this format better um and remember the the subscript i means for every generalized coordinate you have one of these equations so this, this is not one equation this is n equations so what is l i, I like to write it a script for the lagrangian this is the kinetic energy minus the potential so that's uh, kinetic and we are stipulating in this uh, uh, in this problem that there is uh, a gravitational field equal to little g that uh, could be earth's gravity or we just, we're just going to keep it generalized and um, in variable form so that we can um, solve this for any gravitational field it could be on on the moon or on kepler 22b or in, in any any gravitational field you want and so we're going to keep everything super general and in order to solve essentially an infinite number of problems at once. And that's that's something you could tell your friends. I solved an infinite number of problems in one fell swoop. <laughs> so that, that's kind of fun. So let's, let's look at this. So we know in our current problem, we've chosen uh, theta 1 and theta 2 uh, for our generalized coordinates, q1 and q2. So in this case, we have n equals 2. So the first thing you want to do is remember your basic trig um, designations. If we put the origin right here uh, at the pivot point of the first, uh, of the, the main hinge of the whole system. So we have the x-coordinate of the first mass is L1 sine theta 1. And we have x, or sorry, y1 equals minus L1 cosine theta 1. Yeah, so let's have uh, y be up. And so with these, these coordinates for the x and y location of this, of the, just the first mass. The second one, the second mass has an x coordinate of L1 sine theta 1 plus L2 sine theta 2. So remember, to get to the second mass, you have to, you would first start at the origin and then go down to the first mass along some theta 1 and L1 and then down to the second mass and there you go, you're, you're home. So it's sort of that the second mass sort of depends implicitly or indirectly, I guess, on the first one because they're attached. And so for y2, we have minus L1 cosine theta 1 minus L2 cosine theta 2. All right, so these, this is the starting point of everything. And we want to now write down the potential energy and the kinetic energy of the system. 
m1 g y1 plus m2 g y2. And we already have our y's. They're here and here. So we just plug those in. You get minus m1 plus m2 gl1 cosine theta1 minus m2 gl2 cosine theta2. Alright, so this is the first equation. I'm going to put it in a box because this is an intermediate result. And now we need to find the kinetic energy denoted by T. And remember T is one half mv squared, but we have to add up the velocities and um, square them times half the mass for each mass. So we have one half m one v one squared plus one half m two v two squared. Now here's the here's the thing. So we need to write we need to write down an expression for the velocities. And so th those come from noting that uh, v1 squared is x1 dot squared plus y1 dot squared. So we have to take the time derivative of x1 and y1, square each of them, add them up. You'll notice there's a sine here and a cosine here. So we will be getting a sine squared theta 1 and a cosine squared theta 1. So we're going to have some cancellation going on here. Um, so let's let's look at that real quick. So x dot, x1 dot, is L1. So what's the, the derivative of sine? Well, it's, it's cosine cosine theta 1 times, remember the chain rule, times the derivative of theta 1 with respect to time, which is theta 1 dot. And, uh, and for y1 dot, you have, what's the derivative of cosine minus sine? So we get L1 sine theta 1 theta 1 dot and these are outside of the argument of the trig function. And you'll do the same thing for y, y2 and x2, and you'll, you'll plug them into here. And uh, when you do that and combine all the like terms, I'll show you the, the final result. You get t equals 1 half m1 l1 squared theta 1 dot squared. Uh, plus one half m2 l1 squared theta 1 dot squared plus l2 squared theta dot 2 squared. These are the angular momenta. This is like um, one half i omega squared. Let me draw this a little lower. Um, we'll get to that more in a moment. Uh, then we have uh, plus, we have the cross terms, plus 2L1, L2, theta1 dot, theta2 two dot, cosine of theta1 minus theta2. Phew! And there you go. That's the kinetic energy of the system. Now remember, we have, all right, so the next thing we want to do is construct our Lagrangian by uh, making use of the V and T that we have found. So that T and that V, so now we can construct our Lagrangian L equals T minus V. So let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at that. So let's write down our full Lagrangian, if we could even fit it on one line here, it is just this minus that. And so let, let's see if I could do that here. 1 half m1 l1 squared theta 1 dot squared plus 1 half m2 
L1 squared theta dot squared plus L2 squared theta dot 2 squared plus 2 L1 L2 <coughs> theta 1 dot theta 2 dot cosine of theta 1 minus theta 2 now a minus a minus minus a negative is a positive so we have m1 plus m2 gl1 cosine theta1 it's going to be close can i do it let's see here plus m2 gl2 yeah i got it cosine theta2 this whole thing is lagrangian for just this really simple textbook problem. No air resistance, no friction, massless rods. It's just absolutely mind mind boggling how um, how complex real systems would be. Imagine every atom and every particle and not even in the universe, just in like um, a grain of sand. There are more atoms in a typical grain of sand then there are stars in the universe, and uh, each one of those has their own six degrees of freedom, that is to say three positions and three momenta. The Lagrangian for that thing would, would, would be unfathomably large. So be happy that we just have this uh, comparatively little guy. I dropped a, a parenthesis here. I'm going to use square brackets. It's a little bit easier. To see. Um, I think, yeah, that's where it goes. All right, so the first thing we want to do is take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the, um, the, the Q dots. That's the time derivative. And so when we do that, we'll get, um, so DL d theta dot one that's a terrible theta sorry i'm still getting used to this drawing board theta one dot equals m1 l1 squared theta one not squared because that because of the power rule um, theta one dot plus m2 L1 squared theta 1 dot plus M2 L1 L2 theta dot 2 um, cosine theta 1 minus theta 2. All right, so now we want to take the time derivative of that, the full derivative, not the partial, dl d theta 1 dot, and you get after doing some algebra and don't forget the product rule like for this term here you'll have a um, you'll have a theta 2 double dot times cosine theta 1 minus theta 2 then you'll have a theta 2 dot so you'll add to that it'll be plus theta 2 dot and then the derivative of this guy and then even the chain rule the derivative of the interior uh, of the, or rather the argument of this and when you do all that you get m1 plus m2 l1 squared theta1 double dot plus m2 l1 l2 theta2 double dot. So the double dots are the second time derivative. <clears throat> Minus m2 l1 l2 um, theta 2 dot um, sine theta 1 minus theta 2 times theta 1 dot minus theta 2 dot. Whew! There we go. The key is to just go through it term by term, take it one thing at a time, be very careful, and try to, at all costs, avoid any a uh, transcription errors those are the worst all right dl d theta because so now we have d by dt of dl d theta dot but now we need the dl d theta 
So we have dl d theta 1. And that equals minus L1G M1 plus M2 <clears throat> sine theta 1 minus M2 L1 L2 theta 2 dot um, theta 1 dot sine theta 1 minus theta 2. Yeah, that's correct. So for the dl by d theta 1, you'll go through and you'll find, so this term would be 0 because that's not a theta. That's a theta dot. Uh, the same for here and here. Um, this right here is the first term that is non-zero. So you have a theta 1 and a theta 2. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. There's the negative, there's the sine, and then you have the 1 half m2 factoring through. The 1 half annihilates the 2, and you have the m2 l1 l2 theta 1 dot theta 2 dot, then the derivative of that um, trig factor. And then same for, um, for these two, and they've been combined into one term by factoring out uh, the sine theta 1. You always need to be weary for typos and errors. Those are the worst. So what we have now is just uh, an assembly problem. All we got to do is put these together. It's this term, and then we have equation 5 and 6. So because of equation 1, this term minus that term equals 0, we only need equations 5 and 6 um, in order to get the full equation of motion. And there's a lot of algebra going on in here, and I don't even know if I have a big enough digital paper to, <laughs> to do that. If I had like regular like printer paper, I would even turn it sideways, like landscape mode instead of portrait and write out these derivations lengthwise. But if I were to spare you the algebra and give you the final result, the equation of motion. All right, so here are the equations of motion for M1 and M2. I have done all the algebra and simplifications and made it nice and neat and tied it in a little bow for you. And remember I told you N equals 2, capital N equals 2. And so we have an equation of motion for both theta 1 and for theta 2. Now you'll notice uh, in each equation you have both theta 1 and theta 2, as well as M1 and M2. But that's just to say that these are, are coupled differential equations and uh, the solutions of which can be plotted in Mathematica using numerical um, numerical solutions of a couple differential equations. And so uh, you have the equations of motion for M2 down here. Again, same story. It shows um, quantities from both theta1 and theta2, L1 and L2, and uh, m1 and m2. But this is the equation of motion for m2. You'll see they're slightly different. Uh, the first term here is the m1 plus m2 theta1 double dot, and you don't get a th um, the same thing for m2. You only have an m2 l2 theta double dot. But these are these are the, uh, the equations of motion. So now let's um, Let's look at the the next part of the of the video where we go into Mathematica and look at the um, the, the time evolution as sort of a simulation um, that that these equations produce. In Mathematica, I have the double pendulum workbook that I've prepared, and I've made a, a module, a manipulate module. And you have your local variable designation list up here. And then you have your, your equation. And you'll recognize this m1 plus m2 
L1 theta double dot plus M2 L2 theta 2 double dot cosine of theta 1 minus theta 2 plus M2 L2 theta dot squared sine of theta 1 minus theta 2 plus G M1 plus M2 sine of theta 1 equals 0. So that's one of the equations. And then we have our second equation down here. And I won't read through that for you. They're, they're in reverse order in the way I solved them. The top one is for theta 2 and the bottom one is for theta 1. And um, we have some initial conditions here. And um, I'm not going to go through every little thing, but um, you, you can um, you can look through this. And I make uh, well, this thing makes a sort of um, little animation here. This shows you the time evolution in very qualitative format of the blue and green masses. There are slider bars over here. You can make um, you can make like the green mass more more massive than the second mass and so forth. Um, you could change the gravitational constant of acceleration. You could change the initial conditions and uh, and all of this stuff. There's a, a another thing I've uh, prepared for you, which is this GIF. So the blue dot is the pivot point. That's not a mass. Only the red ones are masses. And this is the initial setup. You have um, mass 1 out at, an, um, at a horizontal uh, orientation, and then mass 2 is 90 degrees straight up. And you just hold it in this exact position and drop it, and it, and it goes through. And, he, and you can watch some of the things it does. You'll get these states where the second mass is like swinging around and you'll get these states where the whole thing is sort of moving as one cohesive unit. So let's let's replay that one more time. Now, if you were to drop this thing from an attempt to drop it from the exact same position every time, because there's a fundamental limit to how accurately you can achieve the same exact initial conditions. You will notice that the, um, the pendulum is not doing the same thing every time. Now this, this one is, because this isn't actually uh, like a, a real world experiment. This is just code replaying over and over. But if you were to do this in real life, you would drop it a thousand times from the same position but because you're never going to get it infinitely accurate, nothing could be infinitely accurate, especially because um, you're going to eventually reach the limits of quantum mechanical uncertainty. Uh, that is to say, uh, positions that are not defined or reproducible, reliably reproducible. And this is a chaotic system. Now, chaos is a word that's thrown around a lot. It doesn't mean death and destruction. It doesn't mean fires and, and zombies and chaos, at least in the mathematical and physics sense, means that the time evolution of a system is extremely sensitive to the initial conditions. The consequences of this is that the system, even if it's described by deterministic fully analytical closed form equations that 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 explicitly determine the fundamental governing dynamics of the system the system will not evolve deterministically that is to say it will diverge exponentially in time from what you expected it to do because you can never set up the initial conditions with infinite accuracy each time. Nor can you know what those initial conditions are exactly. You can only know approximately what they are. Pick your decimal point. And this is one of the reasons why weather 
prediction is is a stochastic and unpredictable process because even with the wealth of volumes and volumes of satellite and other atmospheric based data petabytes and petabytes of data and supercomputers crunching the numbers you're not going to be able to capture the exact state of the entire atmosphere it's just not going to be possible certainly not with the data volumes and processing power we have today Certainly not. And that's why you, you might have noticed the weather forecasts are, are typically no good more than a day or two out. And the further out in time you look, the less and less accurate they are. So um, it's, it's fun sometimes, or prudent even, to look at the 10-day forecast. I do it all the time. But every day into the future from, from the present, I keep myself... And my, I keep in mind of myself that they're less and less accurate because of the, the unpredictable nature, the chaotic, nonlinear dynamics of uh, a weather system. I mean, for goodness sake, we're looking at just two, two masses on a massless rod with no friction, no air resistance. There are hundreds of billions of metric tons of air and water and energy flux, and, and it's extremely chaotic and it's it's unfathomably complex as well and so next time the forecast is correct a day or two out be grateful and appreciate all the the data processing and all the data acquisition and modeling all the hard work that these meteorological scientists did in order to get you even just a one day forecast that's accurate. Two days is, is also pretty good. Anything beyond three days or so, you start, you start getting into some pretty dicey waters there. All right, folks, clear skies.